for uh, more than 10 years now. The one thing that uh, I guess you should know about me for this, uh, for this talk is that I'm very enthusiastic about this product. And I'm, I'm not enthusiastic about Gemstone because I work at Gemstone. I work at Gemstone because I'm enthusiastic about the product. Um, anything else you need to know about me, you can find out by looking at my bio uh, on the website uh, under this talk. Uh, if you go there, you will also notice that this talk is there. That place is entitled Gemstone for Dummies. I was thinking about that and I thought, you know, Gemstone isn't just for dummies. So I changed the title a little bit. But it is about sort of the basics that everybody needs to know about Gemstone if they're going to use it. So first question. Is what is Gemstone apps anyway? Well, the answer is it's a small bug implementation, like Squeak, or like VisualWorks, like VA Smalltalk. You know, it has a VM, it has some class library. You know, it's a small bug implementation. So it has a lot of things in common with all of the others. And I know from the responses we got to questions yesterday that almost everybody here is an experienced Smalltalk user. So I'm not going to talk about all the things that are the same, which is most everything. It's small talk, right? I'm going to talk about what's different from those other implementations. So the biggest difference is that Gemstone is designed to be a server-side small talk. Well, what does that mean? Well, there's two big things that make it a server-side small talk as opposed to most other small talks. It's headless and it's multi-user. Well, if it's headless, if it hasn't have a GUI, then you know, that's pretty easy to understand. But then that raises a couple of questions like, well, how do you deploy an application on it? Well, clearly, you don't deploy a desktop application directly on Gemstone. Um, so there's a couple of, of common patterns. You can deploy an application with a desktop web client uh, pointing to a Gemstone server that's running Seaside or, or Ada or something like that. Or you can run a, a desktop application that is written in one of the other small talks, uh, VisualWorks or VA small talk, using a Gemstone product called GBS, Gem Builder for Small Talk, which is a, a uh, special purpose distributed object system that's designed to work between one of the client small talks and the Gemstone server small talk. And GBS um, has some nice uh, transparent ways of doing that. It gives you uh, forwarding proxies that will forward messages in one direction or the other, so you can do message sends across between the two hands. <coughs> it also allows uh, replication of objects, so that the object can live in both uh, VMs, the same logical object, and that the state of those objects are automatically synchronized. And I'm not going to be going into that any deeper today. We are trying to get through all of this in 45 minutes, and there's quite a bit of it. Um, and what do you do about application development? Well, there are development tools in GBS, browsers, inspectors, debuggers, and so on. Uh, and also, uh, within the last year and a half, we have developed a set of tools uh, in Squeak that let you use browsers and debuggers and so on um, using a Squeak image that is connecting to uh, the Gemstone server VM. Okay. The other difference, the big one, is multi-user small talk. But well, what does it mean to be a multi-user small talk? Well, first let's look at, at what the normal flow is in a, in a regular small talk. You, you start a VM, it loads up a whole bunch of objects from an image file, every object in its world. It loads that world into memory, starts executing. Objects get sent messages, they change their state, new objects are created, old objects are garbage collected. At some point, if you want to make that persistent, you can save the image. This either writes out a new file or overwrites the existing file. Once again, every object in the world is just written to disk, frozen in time, and can be resurrected into a new virtual machine at any time. And while certainly you can launch multiple virtual machines for multiple users off of the same image file, if multiple users try to save the image to the same file, then they're just going to clobber each other's changes, and it's going to get really messy really fast. So that's really a single user model of persistence, and it really only works for one for one user at a time to be to be actually making changes and saving them persistently. 
So what you might like if you wanted to solve to be multi-user, that you could have multiple VMs running at the same time and making changes, and you want them to share those changes with each other, what you might want is that when you save the changes to the image, that they get merged somehow with everybody else's changes. And that's, you know, then you have some kind of multi-user persistence model, and that's exactly what Hempstone does. And the model that we use for controlling this you know, merging of, of changes is the transaction model, which is uh, familiar from databases. So the, the flow goes something like this. You do a begin transaction by sending a begin message, or a begin transaction message. And that, what that does is that then um, updates your view of the shared image, which in Gemstone is called a repository, so that you're now looking at the state that the objects in your VM have is now the state of whatever everybody else has committed up to that point. Um, and now, from that point forward, <coughs> that view doesn't change. You see that state for all the objects, plus any changes that you and your VM make. Any changes that may be committed by other people in other VMs during your transaction, you don't see those changes. This is a property that in databases is called read consistency. In a typical relational database, read consistency only applies during the execution of a single select statement. So you start your select statement, it operates against the committed state of the database uh, at that moment, but it's guaranteed not to change until your select statement finishes executing. But then if you turn around and issue another select statement immediately afterwards, then you may get different results because somebody else may have committed in the meantime. Uh, with Gemstone, you begin your transaction from the time that you begin your transaction until the time you abort or commit your transaction, you get a consistent view of the database uh, all the way through. So you've got your view, you're making your changes, you're sending messages to objects, they may be changing their state. Um, if you decide you want to throw that work all away for some reason, you can abort your transaction. And the abort um, throws away your changes and then updates you to the latest committed view of the repository, just like the begin did. If you've done some work and you decide that you do want to save those changes, then you send the commit transaction message. And that merges your changes with any other changes that have been committed since you did your begin transaction. And the merged result is becomes the committed state of the repository. And then your view is updated to that merged view. So that sounds fairly simple, but there are, of course, some complications. Just like you know, merging anything, like merging in a source code repository, it's possible if two people are doing something too close together for the different changes to conflict with each other when you try to merge them. So, so normally what happens in Gemstone, uh, a Gemstone application, is that uh, if, you know, if there's a conflict it's, it's detected at commit time, and the, con and, the, and the commit fails, and then you have to handle that. Um, you know, this is called optimistic concurrency control. And because you're hoping that most, you believe that most of your commits will not conflict, and you don't have to deal with this very often. So it's, assume it's going to succeed most of the time, and then uh, detect when it uh, when it doesn't, when you do have a conflict, and the system does that for you automatically. And then you have to, if you do get a conflict, you have to handle it. Uh, and there are, are messages you can send to find out you know, what objects conflicted and that sort of thing. Typically what you have to do is abort your transaction and redo whatever work makes sense now, makes sense to do given the new state of the positive. If the thing you were conflicting on was, say, like a bank balance, and there was a deposit that conflicted with a withdrawal. Well, you can't just rewrite the value you were going to put into the balance. You have to recompute it, you know, that sort of thing. So it's kind of application specific how you would recover from that kind of situation. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> if 
alternative, if you've got some objects that a lot of people write that you might conflict on, you can use pessimistic concurrency control, which means locking. You can acquire there's a couple of different kinds of locks in Gemstone that you can get um, to lock an object. And once you acquire a lot, the right kind of lock on an object, then you're guaranteed that nobody else is going to be able to commit a change to that object. So you know that you can commit a change to that object without without conflicting. Um, the, uh, uh, the 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 standard unit of detecting what a conflict is in a source code control system, if Person A concurrently modifies one file with somebody else modifying a different source code file, then that's clearly not a conflict. Um, similarly, in, uh, in Gemstone, if you modify different objects, that's considered not a conflict. Uh, in a source code control system, sometimes they're smart enough to say if you modify one part of a file versus some other part of a file, uh, but that can be considered not a conflict either. <laughs> Usually, most objects are of a small enough uh, granularity that, that Gemstone tends to consider, by default, any change to the same object in concurrent sessions, concurrent transactions, is considered a conflict, uh, a physical conflict. But there are some kinds of objects that that you you might you know sometimes you might have things that don't logically conflict, like if you had an, an employee object. Uh, and one transaction, you know, was the, the the personnel department. And one part of the personnel department is modifying that employee's address because he's moved, and a different person in the personnel department is modifying his salary because he got a raise. You know, these don't logically conflict with each other, but they might be changing the same object. So by default, Gemstone will consider that a conflict and reject it. And in fact, with that particular kind of example on a small object like an employee object is rare enough that usually nobody worries about that. That kind of falls into the detect it, handle it, redo it, um, and deal with it. But for things like collections, like say the collection of all employees, in a big company maybe it's fairly common for two different people in the personal department to be adding a new employee to the collection of all employees. And if you don't want to consider that a conflict because if it's a set and two different objects get added by two different sessions, you know, there's no reason that that conflict. It doesn't matter what order they come in. You know, there's nothing, nothing that says this one has to happen before that one. The result at the end is both employees are now in the set. So in order to allow that, Jumpstone offers uh, some uh, reduced conflict classes. Mostly, uh, most of them are collections. Um, the class names start with RC, and it's reduced conflict, not conflict-free, because there are still some cases where you want to have conflict. Uh, for instance, in a dictionary, if two sessions concurrently add the same key but with different values, you know, that's a conflict. And you want to know about that. Okay, so you're all sharing this big pool of objects. Well, sometimes you just you don't want to share everything. You might want to have some objects that are private to your VM space that don't become persistent, that are just you know used in your VM, and and that you know Gemstone does allow that. So the the thing that determines whether an object is pers persistent or transient is where it's connected. Uh, in garbage collection in a system like, like Squeak, uh, the things that are live objects are the objects that are reachable from some, from some set of persistent root or some set of roots. And in Squeak, the root is the small talk uh, system dictionary. Everything that's, that's, that's reachable from there is alive. And also anything that's reachable from, uh, from temporary variables on the stack. And in Gemstone, there's a special uh, array in the, in the virtual machine that is called the session state. We tend to use session because it's like a database session uh, almost synonymously with, with the virtual machine. They're actually separate concepts, but they're one to one, so we tend to use the terms a little, a little more interchangeably than we should. 
the uh, so that session state object, you know, is the root for all the transient objects. So you can put stuff in there that's not on the, plus anything that's on temporary variables in the stack. Transient objects clearly can live in there. So if you create new object after a VM starts up, and they're either on the stack or you connect them to make them reachable from the, the session state, then those objects will just live there happily in your VM. Now there's also a persistent root that's in the, that's in the repository. And that <coughs> persistent root is shared, of course, across all the VMs. And if, once you make an object referenced from a persistent object, any persistent object, then it is now reachable from the persistent root. And when you commit your transaction, that formerly transient object will now become a persistent object. And the name of the persistent root is all users, not that it matters for this. Um, how big can we go with this? Well, one of the other differences in, small, in uh, Gemstone small talk is that this is not limited by memory. In most small talks, you load the entire image file into your VM, you run, it's all in memory. So that kind of limits how many objects you can have to the size of your memory. In Gemstone, uh, the VM only brings in the memory of the objects you're actually using. And, uh, and if you're using more objects than will fit into memory, then some of them will get dropped out of memory periodically. There's also a, a, a large shared memory region that multiple virtual machines on the same uh, on the same machine can can share uh, a memory region for a bunch of objects. So, uh, yeah, so we've got customers who are using billions of objects in their repository, hundreds of gigabytes, uh, and you know you can have collections that are that are millions in in size. And being able to find things in those collections can take a while. So we do offer an indexing and query system which in 45 minutes we don't really have time to talk about. We could spend a couple hours just talking about that. So, sometimes you hear people say, oh, Gemstone, that's an object database. So based on what I just told you, is it, is it fair to say that Gemstone is an object database? Yes. Well, I think it's fair to say that Gemstone includes an object database. But I don't think it's fair to say it is an object database. Gemstone is a small talk implement. <laughs> it happens to have an object database sort of built in very, very tightly coupled. Uh, but it's actually, because of that, it's easier to use than most object databases because it is so tightly integrated with the execution machinery. And of course, it's incredibly easier to use um, you know, for, for storing persistent data than from a small type application than, say, a relational database. Uh, yeah, I guess it's the relational databases that are for the dummy. <laughs> so, as, as, as time goes on, you've got all these persistent objects in your repository. Now, you may want to change your application. You may want to add an instance variable to a class. Now, for instance, the, in, um, in something like Squeak, if you add an instance variable to a class, what happens is that it goes out, scans through memory, finding all the instances of that class, and mutating all those instances so they're now a little bigger to have room for that instance variable. And this all happens all, all at the time you change that, and, and then it's done. Well, when you've got a few hundred gigabytes of objects on disk, it's no longer a few hundred milliseconds to do that job. It can take, it can take a while. Um, and some applications can't stand the downtime that it would take to actually scan all of this, finding all the instances of that class and, and, and mutating them. So Gemstone allows you to have concurrent different versions of the same class uh, at the same time with instances of each and, and do, the, and do the, the migration of those instances from one version of the class to the other at whatever schedule makes sense for your application. Well, okay, so class versions sound kind of like, oh, what's that? Uh, that's that's, that's a, kind of a scary concept. Well, they're just classes. 
every version of a class is really just a class. So version one of class foo and version two of class foo are really just different classes. They just happen to have the same name. And they also are uh, connected together by a, uh, by a class history object. And that's how the system knows that your intent is that these be considered versions of the same class. And that information is used for knowing what migrations are typically allowable. And it's also used for, um, not that we want to use, is kind of off in our, in our applications. But if you, add, if you say, is kind of foo, and the foo you give it is version 2 foo, and you send that to a version 1 object, foo object, if they're in the same class history, it will return true. If they're not in the same class history, then then it won't. Uh, the class history is just an ordered collection of, of classes that represent the versions of those classes. Uh, the, uh, also, you don't need a new class version whenever you change a method, or add a method, or remove a method. It's structural changes to the class. If you change the class's name, if you add or remove instance variables, that kind of thing. That, for that sort of thing, you need, you need a new, a new uh, class version. Because, because those kinds of changes, uh, especially adding and removing instance variables, require you to change all of the instances of that class. So now I'm going to do class version. Yes? Um, can you just submit happily with uh, 10 different versions of the class without migrating them? Uh, depending on your application, yes. You know, if you're adding if you're adding an instance variable, then then you're adding it for a reason. You, you want to use it, and as long as you've got instances that don't have that instance variable around, you won't be able to use it. So usually, a typical sequence would go: add the instance variable, migrate the instances over a certain amount of time, so that all the instances then become instances of the new version of the class, and then you can then roll out the methods that start using that instance variable once the release has got that. You know, now, in some application specific circumstances, you might be able to live with some mix one way or the other. But you, you see what I think? Yeah. But you, for example, could have a, have a version for the non-migrated classes returning some default or so. Absolutely. So yes. you can have concurrent uh, methods for the same selection. Well, remember, each, yes, because remember, each class version is just a different class. They're really just separate classes. So yes, each class version has its own method dictionaries. The methods can be completely different. So, you know, the classic example is, you know, the, the point that stores x and y and the point that stores r and theta, and they both have an x message, and one has to be computed from the r and theta, and one is just an instance variable accessor. What's well, just the notebook? <laughs> right. So, um, in order to do the migration, Typically, you send migrate to each object. And previous to doing that, you, you will have set a, a migration destination to the version of the class that it was from, so that it knows what version it's going to migrate to. And by default, it just maps the instance variables with the same names across. And if you're doing something more complicated, like you need to do the R theta conversion, or if you need to map, if you're changing an instance variable name, for instance, uh, then you need to set up a little more mapping beforehand, but that's not too hard to do. Another aspect of a, of a multi-user small plug that you might want to think about is when you've got multiple people using it, it's no longer really a personal system like small plug 80 was really meant to be. So security becomes an issue. And there's a couple of security mechanisms uh, in Gemstone. There's user level security. When you start up your VM, Right, I mean, it has to be able to access the repository because that's where all the objects are. Just like you can't start a sweep VM without an image. But in order to access the repository, you first have to give it a username and password. And the repository stores the information in it about what users are allowed to access and what their passwords are. So there's that level. Once you're logged in, then what user you logged in as determines kind of what, uh, what you can do. And there's a few special privileges, and about 10 of them, I think, uh, in all. Uh, privileges like, that can be assigned to any set of users. Uh, privileges like, oh, the ability to modify other people's passwords. 
Yeah, that's, that's clearly an administrative privilege. We're going to give that to everybody. And there's a uh, code modification privilege that you need in order to be able to, to uh, compile methods and put them in method dictionaries. <coughs> Typically, you give that to all your developers, but not your users necessarily. Uh, besides the privileges, there's also uh, object level security. Every object in the system is associated with an object access policy. Uh, and an object access policy is an object, and it's an object of class segment. Ignore the name segment because it confuses everyone. Uh, we're thinking of actually changing it to object access policy or something very similar to that. And through the object access policy, you end up with a security model that's very much like Unix file permissions. So each object access policy has defines uh, the permission level for the user that owns that object access policy, the group that is associated with that object access policy, and the abilities for everybody else. So, uh, yes? Is uh, the number of policies uh, customer Wait, say again. Is uh, this post uh, permissions customizable? Uh, are the permissions customizable? Um, no, not directly. What you have is you have the, the, the you, you can either have the permission to read the object, which is uh, just the, the permission to, to you know, if, you, if you don't have read permission to the object, if you have no access to the object, you can, you'll get an error if you even send a message to it. Uh, if you have read-only permission to the object, then, then you can do anything you want with it until you try to assign to one of its instance variables. And if you send it a message that tries to cause an assignment to the instance variable, then you'll get an error at that point. Um, and if you have read-write permissions, then you can do anything you want with the object. And other than that, we really don't have. But you can do this on an on object-by-object object basis. So you know, every object has is associated with uh, with an object access policy. Now, of course, you know through the normal mechanisms of small talk, where you can uh, you know guard objects so that uh, you know in order to, to get a reference, you never get a reference to that object. You have to talk through a different object to talk to it, and that object can implement a guarding policy. You know that sort of thing that's available in any small talk is, of course, also available in, in Gemstone. So that would be, you know, if you really wanted to customize, that would be the way you do it. Uh, but this gives you a hard, you know, even if I've got a reference to it, I can't modify it kind of, kind of thing. Uh, so a couple of other differences. Uh, in Gemstone, objects are variable size. In most, uh, in most small talks, the number of, of Indexed instance variables in an object is fixed at the time that the object is created. In Gemstone, that's not true. You can say add to an array, and the array gets bigger, for instance. So you can do the same thing with strings. Uh, and another difference is the way that Gemstone does global name resolution. The, you know, for instance, in, in Squeak, you know, when you're compiling code and you've got global names, the names of global variables in your in your program, uh, in your method source code, it looks that name up in the Smalltalk system dictionary. And if it finds it, there's the binding. If it doesn't find it, it's not defined, and you get an error. Well, in Gemstone, it's a little more complicated than that. There are multiple system dictionaries, each one of which is sort of similar to that Smalltalk dictionary in C. <coughs> but it's uh, you know, but there are more than one of them. So. Which ones does it look in and in which order? Well, that's what a symbol list is for. There's a, a symbol list that's the current symbol list for every uh, virtual machine. And it just it's like a, a path um, in Unix. It, it looks first in the first symbol dictionary, and second in the second symbol dictionary, and third in the third symbol dictionary that's in the symbol list. And, and that's how it finds the bindings for, for global variable names. So what, what good is that? Well, there are several possible uses of it. 
it, it does provide a mild sort of security uh, ability because every user has, you know, every named user in the system has a defined symbol list for that user. So different users, when compiling code, can see different things or not see different things. So if a, if a particular class or global that's in a, a particular symbol dictionary, if you don't want a user to be able to access that, then, uh, then one way to do that is simply take that symbol dictionary out of their symbol list, and then they can't see that anymore. And not all users have the ability to, to modify their own symbol lists. So, so that's one way to do it. But of course, if you, if you can get an access, if you can find a reference to that object some other way, that doesn't prevent you from getting to it. So it is only a, you know, a fairly mild form of security. If you really want you know, somebody to not be able to access that, it's better to use the object level uh, security for that. Um, it also allows um, multiple developers <coughs> on the same project to share the same repository for their development work. Because you can, uh, you know, you can each one can have a, a symbol list that points at, at symbol dictionaries for the version of code they're running on, and somebody else may have different versions of classes with the same names uh, in the repository also. And those versions of the classes will be in their symbol dictionary, and, and things don't conflict. Uh, that's not nearly as important as it used to be, because uh, you know, in the old days, you know, a, a gemstone repository was a relatively heavyweight thing and and uh, you know not every developer had access to their own repository. These days, you know, they're still kind of heavyweight, but machines have gotten a lot more capable. So you know, so something like this can hold several gemstone repositories concurrently running without any problem. So giving every developer their own repository is very easy nowadays. Probably the most interesting possible use of of uh, symbol lists is uh, is namespacing in that it gives you a, a mechanism whereby you can you know, have multiple classes uh, with the same name you know in different packages and be able to uh, you know and be able to not have those conflict because this is a compile time thing if you're loading in a package that has a name that conflicts with another package or might conflict then you just don't have that other package in the in the symbol uh, list its dictionary, don't have its dictionary in the symbols when, you, when you're doing the compile. Um, you can also, when you're loading in a package uh, and compiling it, you could, you could set up a symbol list that contains only the things that are prerequisite for that one package, and then, and then you've uh, got it all nicely divided out. So, I'm just about done, but earlier I said that Gemstone was headless. And that is largely true, but it's not, you know, very recently I've started playing with some stuff that makes it not quite entirely true. So I'm going to take this, execute it in Gemstone. All right, so I get this little window here. Now this is a window that's being produced from a Gemstone VM. I initiated that through VisualWorks, through uh, GBS, but this, is, this window belongs to the Gemstone virtual machine. And this is actually a port of a little um, X Windows demonstration from, from the uh, Cola project that Ian Kumar is doing. So I know you can't read what's in there, but down here it says you can type stuff into this box. And by golly, you can. And it also says click the green box for a thrill. Ooh. <laughs> and it says click the background to exit, and it does. So, you know, so it's certainly possible to write interfaces in, uh, and this was all done in Smalltalk, uh, in Gemstone. So it's certainly possible to write things that interact with traditional GUI elements uh, from inside of small, uh, Gemstone Smalltalk. It's just that uh, well, most people don't do that. Okay, um, so if you want further information, it looks like we're going to have a few minutes for questions. But before we get into that, the, um, there are a couple more presentations uh, here at ESUG uh, on Thursday. Uh, Dale um, is going to be talking about uh, Share Everything, 
uh, right before lunch on Thursday. And right after lunch on Thursday, uh, James Foster is going to be uh, doing a mini hands-on session uh, where you can uh, start to, to uh, uh, hopefully uh, start to implement your own Seaside application uh, in Gemstone. And if you're interested in participating in that, we encourage you to start getting set up uh, for that early so we don't spend the entire hour uh, just getting everybody up and running and not actually doing anything. So uh, talk to one of us uh, about getting a hold of that. James has all the necessary software on you know, on a, on a USB stick. And you can also go and download it from uh, seaside.gemstone.com, uh, which is also the, the best place to go for information about this. It has uh, documentation links, it has download links, it has some, some help links, uh, links to Dale's blog, et cetera, et cetera. So, and of course, you know, talk to me between now and the end of the conference if you're interested. So, questions? Not exactly a question, just adding to that list, I suppose. Uh, Monty is talking about Maglev at some point? Um, yes, I forget. Monty, when is that? Um, last thing, I think it's the last thing Thursday afternoon. It's okay. The, uh, Joshua Project, which is right. late Thursday afternoon. Yeah, Monty is going to be talking briefly about uh, Maglev, which is our Ruby, our new Ruby product that we've announced. Uh, and I won't say more about that because he's going to talk about it. So. And you use the also SQL tools in a Gemstone database. Um, <laughs> Gemstone does have a querying system, but it's not, it's not SQL. The, there have been some efforts to do something like that. It's kind of difficult because SQL assumes that your data is relational. And Gemstone stores <coughs> arbitrary object graphs, which is really nice for your application, but it, doesn't always fit into, into SQL's mindset. So, you know, that's, that's a very, you know, that's, um, you know, that's something that more could be done, but it's, it's very difficult to do something that's, that works in, in certainly all cases. Um, but, you know, if you, yeah, if something could be done that if you structure your data in a certain way, if you had a certain object structure that you could then, you could then query that. Do you, do you think you ever need it? Um, so needing SQL tools? Um, not been needed for 20 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, 20, <laughs> now, 23 years ago, we needed it. Now, Jumpstone's a 25 year old company. Um, but it's, right, it, it, it hasn't, the lack of those hasn't stopped anybody from, you know, or, well, maybe it did stop somebody from using it, but there's a lot of people that use it anyway. Um, Right, yes. Right. We do have a product called Gem Connect, which, which is a, an interface to, you know, to Oracle um, so that you can actually, you can, uh, and th that is a, a pattern that some, uh, that some customers use is to, is to, uh, uh, to duplicate some of the, is to use Gemstone as a repository of record, but then export some of the data out that might be needed for reporting for ad hoc reporting into a relational database and do that. I don't think that's necessarily the best approach, but some people have done it. And Bruce was waving his arm. Well, I was just going to say that we do that. The Postgres drivers will be imported to Gemstone, so you can just emit data to Postgres if that helps. The, the benefit of that is, of course, the <coughs> data connection or DIR or, or anything like that. You can just push the data straight out. And it's not as hard as persistence, of course, because you're just generating SQL and squirting it out. You don't have to worry about object identity or anything. Right. Uh, it isn't just, yeah. No. Well, I mean, you can use it for other things. Okay. 
you know, I mean, what, the only thing that you can't use the free version for is you can't use GBS with it. So you can't. So. <laughs> And but but you know but you're free to do anything anything else. I mean the the squeak tools, for instance, don't rely on the features that GBS uses. So you know so that kind of approach could be used the, for just about anything. The glass is marketing. Right. The license is gemstone. Okay. Right. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Um, speed versus normal SQL databases. I, I don't actually know. It's, it's fairly fast. Ah, James, you may know. Well, part of that is the objects in, in a SQL database, you generally lay out your tables with fixed size rows. And also, in order to get from one row to another, you need to go through foreign keys that will necessitate a lookup in the second table. And if you do multiple joins, a SQL database can be quite slow and can be quite memory intensive. When you're working with pure objects, where you have one object that points to another, and an object consists of only pointers to other objects, <coughs> each object itself is quite small and the pointers to the other objects are quite efficient. And so for anything beyond a trivial size, you're likely to have be much more efficient in, um, in following pointers to other objects for just working your way through than you would be with doing multiple complex joins on a relational database. Yeah. Right. Now also, if you're using a relational <coughs> database in an in a object in a small flock system, you have to have an OR mapping layer in there, which also adds a little bit of not only a, a you don't need no OR mapping layer. Right. And unless you persist again, you don't need the complexity of a complete OR mapping layer. You, know, you can just generate a skill that shoves data out there. You don't have to worry about preserving identity, you don't have to worry about preserving all of the data that Oh for control. dumping, yes. No, that but that's not what I'm yeah, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about using yeah, you know, if you're if you're writing an object application, you know, in Smalltalk, and your database is a relational database, right. and so in that case, you need an OR mapping layer, and that adds an additional, uh, you know, layer of latency and execution that has to happen. So, generally, I mean, we've got some people running some pretty high performance stuff. You know, we've got um, at least one customer that's running several thousand commits per second in production regularly and, and uh, you know, I mean we don't you know I, I know there are some relational databases that are many terabytes in size and we're you know still under a terabyte but yeah. I, I, I think you know I think in general you sit down and go that's a memory reference you're talking about for gemstone all right to a large extent it's a memory reference um, the databases are going to be hitting this um, and copying objects around a lot more, copying memory around a lot more, especially to get it into a small talk image. So I think um, just accessing is faster. I mean, our speeds of VMs approach, you know, VMs that don't have persistent storage. So are they faster than SQL? You know, and I think that, um, and then the other side is on the safe side, all right? I think your uh, gemstone is able to commit much faster than SQL databases and white data because we're again writing small pieces instead of entire rows and there's a whole lot more overhead for uh, database to deal with that. So, but yeah. I'd last. Yeah. Again, I'm sure you can construct scenarios that would make anything look better or anything look worse. But we had one customer post recently saying that uh, their gemstone system is doing 700 transactions a second and their relational system is doing 70 transactions per second on four times the hardware. All right, well, we're out of time. So if you've got any more questions, you know, certainly talk to one of us um, at, at a break or, uh, or after the conference. Thank you very much.